I hope that I can be heard. Uh, yes, so I would like to start today's seminar. I think we have many people already online. It is four o'clock. Oh, just wait, I see a hand. Now, um, yeah, so I will give today's presentation uh, on behalf of the World Potato Congress. I'm very happy and pleased to welcome you to, to today's uh, seminar. And uh, before I start, I would just like to, to capture, I, oh, I don't know if you, I hope you can't see this chat. Let me turn that off so I'm not going to be distracted. Um, yeah, so before I start, I would like to uh, extend a welcome to, to the, the seminar on behalf of World Potato Congress uh, and invite you to uh, the, their Congress next year in Ireland. What a beautiful picture. When I got to put this on my screen, I was really looking forward to uh, attending this conference. Uh, shall everything uh, return to normal and, and this will happen. Um, I am assuming everybody can hear me. I haven't seen any messages. I just want to make sure that there's not a message. It looks like people can. I haven't heard that they can't. But this is my first time to do a presentation without an actual audience. Yes, so uh, again, I will again now start the, the seminar. So again, we're really pleased to uh, welcome you to today's seminar. Uh, I'm Monica Parker. I'm a senior scientist uh, with the International Potato Center. I'm based in Nairobi uh, in Kenya, uh, where I'm a principal investigator of several projects. And I also provide leadership to the Africa uh, component of SIPS Global Potato Program. I am Canadian. Um, I'm having studied and, and did my postdoc studies at the Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and also at the University of Guelph in Ontario. So now I'm pleased to uh, proceed with a seminar on, on apical cuttings. It's a really uh, fascinating uh, uh, intervention that, that we have undertaken here with our many partners uh, in Africa and, and beyond. And so yeah, so today's talk is going to be on the diversified use of apical cuttings uh, to boost potato seed systems. And just before I proceed, I just want to make sure that there's no chat, uh, if people are able to hear me or not. So please, just one moment. I see a couple of messages, but they seem to have uh, disappeared. I think we are okay. Yeah, oh, let me go back here. Yeah, so I just wanted to give first a little bit of a background. Oh, here my messages are coming. I just want to make sure that there's nobody saying if they can't hear me. Oh, good. Okay, I have a confirmation I can be heard. Okay, so now I would like to provide you first with a little bit of a background uh, on, on the technology uh, in Africa and in many developing countries. There's always a perennial challenge of availability of commercial seed for, uh, for potato farmers. Uh, if you go to any meeting, it will always be dominated by this topic or eventually it will lead there about the seed issue. And this also uh, has a consequence of when there's new varieties. And in the last five years, in many countries, there's been many a release of, of new varieties by, by private sector and also by, by public uh, entities. And it also limits uh, access to these new varieties. So uh, in, um, in Vietnam, uh, uh, at SIP uh, and, and with our partners, we, they had looked at, uh, used this uh, uh, technology in Vietnam with much success. So this was under the leadership of Pham Tung and, and Peter Van der Zeg, uh, very uh, active members uh, in the potato community. And uh, they had a lot of success in Vietnam and there was a lot of encouragement to try this technology in Africa and to see how it could work. So we did one small trial uh, in the back of envelope trial just to, to check it out. And, and uh, we had some results, uh, nothing in comparison to what, what we have today, uh, but we were a little bit excited. And then also at the same time, uh, as luck and timing would have it, we, we had a private sector partner come and visit us at SIP and about another matter. And I talked a little bit about this trial. We just had the results and they went back the next day and started it. And, uh, and it was really as a result of this partnership that we were able to, to get to where we are today. Without that, we would not have sprung board so quickly. Uh, and also, as we say, as we, this uh, technology has really springboarded very quickly uh, in, our, uh, in Kenya uh, and beyond. Uh, this is where we started the validation was in Kenya. And initially, we used project support uh, at the initial stages because we had done no validation of this technology when our private sector had come on board. And so we had a, a pro project support to, 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 uh, you know, to get this technology up and running. But since the, the, these uh, initial times, the, the stakeholders have really taken all this technology and, and uh, it's kind of running on its own. And so we're really happy to see that. And, and, and I'm, we're getting a lot of feedback of, of activities in the field around this technology of the cuttings that SIP has had no, no, no intervention in. So very through partners and through word of mouth and, and through uh, actually this technology demonstrating on its own how, how advantageous it is or how it's being taken up. 
uh, initially this technology was introduced uh, under the model that it would be uh, uh, an, an, another kind of starter material, uh, early generation seed for seed potato production. Um, uh, normally we use mini tubers produced uh, in a greenhouse. Uh, cuttings are also produced in this greenhouse, like I will explain. Uh, and the cuttings were seen as an alternative to mini tubers, uh, but never as a replacement. As you will see, there are the pros and cons between uh, both different uh, types of starter material. So just quickly, I wanted to say how seed systems operate a large, a large part in Africa. So then you can see how cuttings can fit into the context of this. Um, and this is also in Africa and in many other developing countries and also I think uh, in, in the developed world is where we have the production of our early generation seed. This is generated from tissue culture plants. It's done under protected conditions in a, in a greenhouse. There are the um, nomads that are taken by national programs, but where there are private sector, we, um, we're finding more and more that private sector are also investing and in getting involved in early generation seed production. So then we take that early generation seed, which is mini tubers and now cuttings, uh, they go to the field. And this is where we have the production of basic seed. Uh, and normally it takes about two generations in the field. And then you go on to further bulk that seed to produce your certified seed. So this is normally done by the same in uh, institutions, public and private. There's different uh, entry points and exit points because you can see as there's you know, different uh, aspects along the seed system here. Then uh, normally you'll see in a lot of uh, developing countries, we have this what we call quality seed, and, and this is onward multiplication by local seed multipliers. Normally uh, the certified seed is produced by few, so it's a little bit more difficult for uh, all farmers to access it. So then we find that there's progressive farmers who multiply this quality seed onwards. And then commercial seed is either bought uh, certified seed and by local seed multipliers. And there's many challenges in the seed systems with quality control, perishability of the seed. Dormancy, we're finding, is a really big challenge to manage and along with lab requirements. So now as we get into apical cuttings after that brief introduction, uh, I'm going to put this next, I want to get this one here. So uh, cuttings are produced from a tissue culture plant. If you look at my slide on the bottom and I'm going to use my cursor, we have our tissue culture plant. Uh, traditionally and in the current systems, those tissue culture plants are put into a nursery, uh, into a greenhouse in protected conditions and that's where they're producing mini tubers. Those mini tubers then go to the field where you have your first two bulking to produce your basic seed and then onward bulking to produce certified and then uh, quality seed. Uh, so the cuttings, uh, those tissue culture plants, you start with the same ones, you produce a cutting in the greenhouse, and then you go on to your onward bulking the same as you would use a mini tuber. Uh, it's like a transplant, so you would, as you would manage uh, any other seedling in the field, this is how you would manage uh, a, a potato cutting uh, after transplanting. So in the production in the greenhouse, you have the production of the cutting, it's rooted, and then once it's rooted, it's taken and it's planted into the field to produce your seed tubers. Uh, in, in, the, in, in systems based uh, or that utilize or cuttings are integrated into seed systems, there's kind of two stages and uh, th there seems to be a little bit of, of um, a, 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 a not clarity in, in exactly how these systems work and this has been coming up in the discussion. So um, I really wanted to clarify in kind of the, the general model of, of how seed systems that integrate cuttings uh, work. And so first you have the initial production of the cuttings in a greenhouse. So this is in a protected environment. They should be disease free. They're in protected environment. They're coming from tissue culture. And then normally this is where you would have a change of hands or, or point of sale. Uh, and then you have the production of, of tubers in the field from cuttings. Um, sometimes the nursery might also be involved in field production. They might do both, or there might be the nursery who specializes in the production of cuttings. And then you have the seed producers who produce uh, tubers from those cuttings. Uh, each cycle from the beginning of the cycle of production of cuttings to when the last cutting is being uh, ready to go plant in the field. So this should last between four to six months. And we've also seen it, it last longer, uh, very incredibly. Uh, but, uh, but this is what we say on average. And uh, when we look at the system uh, at the production stage, what we really look at, because this dictates the price during, with the efficiency of the system of that cutting, is we, when we start with our initial tissue culture plant, how many cuttings we can produce out of that. And, and that is a very important metric in, in assessing the efficiency of the system at the production of the cutting stage. 
As we move on to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit now about the benefits. Why apical cuttings? These are transplants. They're fragile. Uh, you can't pack them like a mini tuber and, you know, mini tubers are much more versatile in their terms of the transport and, and their use. Uh, these are transplants. They have to be used upon reception, but the advantage is really it lies into the, in the high productivity. Uh, if you look here, uh, we have, this was a, a field day. And the, these cuttings were managed. It wasn't spectacular. They weren't over managed, but they were managed following you know, proper guidelines. And you see each one, let me get my cursor, each one of these holes is one cutting. And each one of these holes had between 30 and 45 tubers. And had I not seen this picture and asked the, at the time of harvesting to harvest like this and show, I don't think I could have believed. Uh, it was just absolutely fascinating. And this was also early on. Um, and I just want to bring you to this graph here as we look at a comparison between mini tubers and cuttings. Uh, a mini tuber here we have in green, oh gee, sorry, this is the sensitivity of my thing here. We have on the green, we have the cost of, of a cutting. So a cost in, in Kenya right now, they're selling at 10 US cents and that cutting should produce you between, we say 10 to 15 tubers. Uh, that's the average that we use for our projection. So for 10 US cents, you should expect to produce after your first season of bulking, 10 to 15 tubers, but we often see more, again, depending on the management. If you compare that to a mini tuber, we look on here, a mini tuber in, in Kenya and in Africa is costing between 55 to 25 uh, cents of a dollar. And that mini tuber normally produces you between five to 10 tubers. So when you look at the cost benefit, uh, the cutting is costing less, producing more, while the mini tuber costs more and produces less. But then again, you have to think of the handling and the other logistics around it. So it's not so black and white. Uh, also, when we look here down below, you can see a really fantastic picture of a kind of um, a more average production from a cutting where we have uh, large tubers and also smaller ones being produced. Uh, with, with the cuttings, because of this uh, large number of tubers produced in the first season, um, we can find that cuttings in certain conditions can be profitable after only two seasons of bulking. Normally, we really shy away from selling uh, early generation seed for commercial planting, but under certain situations, uh, this can be effective. Uh, another fascinating aspect about these cuttings, and it's not consistent, and this might spark some conversation at, at the end of this talk and, and beyond, because we would like to understand better, is this rapid maturity. So if we look at this picture here, this is a variety called Unica, popular in many countries. Many of you out there might already know about it. And these were tubers at six weeks after planting. Uh, I was the one who organized the order of these cuttings and I went to that field six weeks. So I was really guaranteed on, on the age. And, and these were already egg sized tubers. Uh, I think there might be a physiological reason for this. It's not entirely, not all cuttings will produce you this at six weeks. And when you see in the production cycle, you have these mother plants and ones that come out later uh, at towards the end of the production cycle, I think are the ones that are a bit older and they are, are hands maturing much more quickly. Uh, but at the end of the day, we did see these tubers that were uh, egg size and, uh, and quite incredible, uh, only at six weeks. Uh, and also, as we will present here and, and into my next slide, is again going where this profitability after two seasons is uh, a lot of times in Africa we find there's very limited land holding to do the many uh, generations of, of traditional seed bulking. And so these cuttings really fit well into areas, and we're um, validating this in one county in, in Kenya where there's extremely small land holdings and how to bring local seed production there. Uh, it was never envisioned it could be done using traditional methods, uh, but in this area, where land is so small that they measure things in terms of uh, uh, terraces rather than um, uh, area because the land holdings are so small. And just as an example of this is if you start with a thousand cuttings, uh, you would need about a 10 by 12 meter plot of land and you produce about 10,000 tubers. Uh, then when you plant that again, that's about a quarter hectare of land based on 46,000 tubers per, per hectare. And that should produce you uh, between four to six and a half and even more tons of seed, which in smallholder conditions is, is enough to really satisfy many farmers. Uh, and also what's a benefit about this is because farmers are accessing very early generation seed seed, uh, it's also compatible with saving seed on farm systems because then uh, they're, they're having seed that's very young and still a very high quality. 
And also when we look at this production of, of tubers, when I'm looking at these 10,000 tubers that are produced off this first cycle here, these are really ones that are big enough to plant on their own the next season. You will also get a lot of very small size tubers, less than 20 millimeters that you would plant in a nursery bed again. And so this production cycle doesn't consider that, which is again about five tubers a plant. So that also adds a, a significant number of seed after another two seasons of bulking. Uh, then now we look at how, um, I'm not talking a lot about in this traditional seed system, now I'm concentrating a little bit now on, on how like the diversified use. We talked earlier about that the cuttings are going through the system as an alternative to mini tubers, which would be bulked by a seed producer to sell certified seed. Uh, when we're looking at diversified use, we're also looking at how can we get farmers to access this technology. If we really want to scale it and, and get it out, uh, seed, seed producers are a limited market. But now if we can get farmers using this technology like they do in Vietnam and, and following this model, we can really now scale this technology so that it can be used directly by many different users. So what we have done is we've gone from this large scale production of cuttings into more small scale production of cuttings in rural areas. And you see we have a small net tunnel. Uh, here is one of our model farmers. She's really one of my heroes. She, she's teaching us now how to do cuttings. She's very, very dynamic and does a lot of troubleshooting in her nursery. So she uh, produces cuttings, I'm going to say maybe 10,000, 20,000, uh, a, a bit more a season. And what she does is she sells them to her neighboring farmers. Uh, she's a well-known uh, farmer in her area and she provides a lot of advice and she was doing other potato related activities earlier and, and then she also uh, uh, ventured into these cuttings. And what she does is with her network of farmers is she uh, sells them cuttings and they produce them in a small seed plot. So they might buy 100 cuttings. I have a two by four meter plot, five by five, like you might see in the sea, this picture. And you see our farmer here with our with producer of cuttings. And then now this, this harvest will be used next season seed. And even from that, she can continue to save seed with the balance of big ones for wear and small ones for a seed. Uh, just quickly, I'm going to review a little bit how, how, how this production is working in this greenhouse, which might lend a little bit of inference into these, uh, see, these tubers that we find at egg size after six weeks. So in the in this greenhouse, you start with your tissue culture plant. Those who are very good might start with uh, even just the, um, the nodal, um, nodal cuttings and or with the whole tissue culture plant. From there, you have your initial plant and then you produce a pool of mother plants. Um, some people it, depending on where you are, you might not have to produce this pool of mother plants, depending on, on how available and the cost effectiveness of tissue culture plants. But in other areas to really maximize that first tissue culture plant, you will spend the first one to two months producing a pool of mother plants from that initial one, all using vegetative means of cuttings. After you develop your pool of mother plants or you have your initial tissue culture plant, then you do the production of the, com of the commercial cuttings that will be planted in the field. So these shoots are transferred into plugs. You can see in this picture here. This is from our large scale uh, partner, uh, Stockman Rosen in Kenya. We're very proud to, to work with them. They're transferring their plugs to their shoots. You can see here the shoot is growing. We're getting the rooting. And then now you have a uh, cutting ready to be planted in the field. And this takes about 14 to 21 days to root. Uh, all depending on temperature and, and day length also plays a role. Uh, like I said earlier, this complete cycle can be between two to four months. And again, the efficiency is about how many from this initial plant at the end of the day, how many commercial cuttings are you producing? So this pool of mother plants will produce cuttings over a two to three to four month period, all depending on, on the mother plant management. And uh, yeah, so what we target is this initial mother plant, depending on whether you do a pool or not, uh, but it should produce between 50 to 200 commercial cuttings. And it's really this, this uh, efficiency that will determine your pricing and your costing, which is always a big, a big question, especially here where farmers have limited access to funds for, for planting material. I wanted to talk, what is the, why are we so productive? Uh, how, what makes these cuttings so productive? And, and that is really the juvenile tissue uh, in, the, in, the, in the young, in the, in the tissue culture plants. And the, the key to uh, successful apical cuttings production is in maintaining your mother plants. And what we mean by the juvenile stage is we have these mother plants and they're all very simple leaves. Uh, they're very, very juvenile and that is where your productivity potential is. So this is again from Our Lady Sacinta in, in Meru. These, these are sub-mothers, so these are from a tissue culture plant, she made more uh, sub-mothers, and these are six months old, and she has just done an incredible job at maintaining her mother plants. This is, again, so critical to the success of the production of cuttings.
I uh, wanted to take a little bit now uh, about the difference between an apical and a stem cutting. So apical cutting is what we've been talking about today and what we're talking about. It's produced from a tissue culture, a plant as its mother plant, and you have a yield potential of 10 to 20 plus tubers per cutting. And you can see here we have our nice young mother plants producing also a cutting that's very young. We don't uh, barely see the compounding of the leaves happening even on the cutting as it's going out. Uh, when we talk about stem cuttings, uh, they are produced normally from mature plants. So you can see here a picture, and these are the mother plants on the picture above. So they're mature plants, and they're producing cuttings, and they do have a place uh, in, in systems when you don't have access to tissue culture plant, or also depending on the system. But these ones do have a much lower uh, yield potential due to their, you're not having the very juvenile stage of the tissue producing your cutting. So I just wanted to bring you some pictures. This is our large scale partner in, in Kenya. You can see here is the screen house. We have the inside of the screen house in three compartments. We have the mother plant zone. Here we have a rooting zone. And then at the end of the screen house, we have a hardening off zone where we removed the, um, the shade net and had it a little bit more open so that more wind can get through to prepare those cuttings for planting in the field. Then you can see here again in the production, the shooting, we have our young plant. And then you can see our close up and then the commercial, the commercial scale production of, of cuttings. Then we take those to the field. So here we have pictures from Kenya and Uganda where we have the planting um, and the different growth stages of, of the cuttings. Uh, and here sometimes, depending if it's very hot uh, and sunny, which can be during, during planting time, we, uh, we, we do encourage the use of, of on, on not too big of a plot, but we've even seen people with a plot of maybe uh, 30 meters by 10 meters covering or even bigger with the shade net for the first week or two to protect them. Uh, but not always necessary and you also don't need such a fancy one. You can also use, as they say here, more local materials uh, to cover the shade net like straw from, from maize. Uh, some of the production from our individual varieties. So we can see here, when we look at production, we really look at number of cuttings because uh, that will uh, determine sort of the area that you will plant the next generation on. So we are here where we're seeing the average between 10 to 15 tubers. And what we look at, these tubers would be greater than about 20 millimeters in size. And these bigger ones would go right out to planting the next season. Whereas we also we have the production of these smaller mini tubers, especially pronounced in Tagoni, where these ones would undergo another nursery season before going out to the field, whereas these bigger ones would go out. So Tagoni, this is a massive number of tubers, is known as a big producer. Uh, and then the transport, how we move them from the nursery out to the field, is we just put them in flower boxes. We lay them in rows with a cardboard between the row, and we get about a thousand a box. Now, this slide, I'm not going to, what I wanted to bring out in this slide is when we talk about business models for cuttings. And uh, earlier, what I showed you, and how even with the traditional way of using mini tubers, there's different entry and exit points into seed systems in terms of the business model for, for uh, to uh, encourage investment in seed production. Now with, with cuttings, it really adds many different layers of different uh, options for business models and diverse business models for, for different players to get involved in seed production, either at the professional commercial stage and also looking at, at, at managing and, and working with smallholder farmers. Uh, so with the cuttings, again, we, we look, we have different, many different models and we have different, many different profiles of seed producers and seed users. So we have different models to match different situations. And as we get into the last slide, it is a couple of considerations of our learning. We've been doing this for about four years now, and we've had a lot of learning when we started. Like we said, we hadn't validated this technology. We had done one small trial, and we really learned as we went. And uh, it's been a very good learning experience because it's been with all of our partners, the, the actual producers of cuttings, the users of cuttings, and the stakeholders who provide that enabling environment. Uh, when we look at producing cuttings, what are the considerations when you're looking to establish nurseries? Uh, you have to look at the temperature. Cuttings, uh, unlike tubers, you want to maintain it warm so that you don't induce tuberization. Uh, so you really want to have warm temperatures during the production of cuttings. And it also really hastens the shoot development and root development because if, when the colder it is, you can find that those cuttings can take a month or even longer before they're ready to plant. And, and that's not very economical in a commercial sense. And day length also has a role. In Vietnam, they have longer days. We thought in Kenya on the equator that might be a problem, but we've, we found that it hasn't been too much of a challenge. We don't get 200 cuttings per, per initial tissue culture plant, but we do have good efficiencies here.
Uh, you have to look at the rooting medium. Uh, this is a challenge. If you look at the picture on the bottom, these plugs are encased with a wrapping. We don't always have access to these kind of plugs in many countries where we would look to produce these. So we look also uh, at a conical plug. And this is also an area for, for knowledge sharing and, and how to, when I've, I've learned that if you produce a, a plant in a conical plug, that the roots will naturally form around the plug. Uh, and that would help to hold the, the medium in place when you're transporting that, that plant, the cutting from the nursery to, to the field. Uh, also really big is fertility. Oh, the fertility of these plugs. They have to grow that plant. You can see they're very small. It, and this is such an important art. And, and in Vietnam, the, the family that produces cuttings, this has actually become their family secret recipe and that they've developed over many years with a lot of troubleshooting. So it really goes to show the value of having a really good fertile rooting medium. And this is also another opportunity for a lot of knowledge sharing. And again, packaging and transportation. Uh, when we look at planting cuttings in the field, uh, spacing, uh, cutworms can be a problem. Uh, actually getting back to spacing, we found a very big effect on spacing. Uh, we look now at two row beds with 30 by 30 centimeters between plants to really optimize the number of tubers and the size. We're not after really big ones in the first round, but we do want big numbers. Uh, we found cutworms can be a problem, so you really have to look out for that. And again here, which is relevant is to water until establishment. Uh, where we see also a wider application of, of the cuttings is how to deploy true potato seed. Uh, when we see a lot of great research and a lot of, of how impact of, of a true potato seed can have on seed systems. But my question here is how are you going to deploy it? How will that seed be used? Will it be dry, directly planted by farmers? Will it be pelleted? Will it go through a nursery system? I'm sure some of it might go through a nursery system. So in, in this case, there's already a system of producing seedlings and also the behavior to use them. Because some people look at a seedling and they question if that can be a tuber or not. So we also have this behavior of, of using it. So with that, uh, before I go into acknowledging, I would also like to um, uh, welcome, I mean, to thank all of my colleagues. I, I wish I could see you all. I, I know you're with us and, and with us in our heart in this time. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, um, I would just like to thank everybody in Kenya. I know you're with me from Peru, from India, all like Madagascar, from Ethiopia, from Malawi, from USA. I know you're there from how I might, I made the list of countries, but if I left you out, you know, Cameroon, Nigeria, uh, we really, really, I wish I could see you, but I'm happy that we're, we're all together. Uh, now I'd like to really thank our partners, that's the private and public sector, without the, the producers and the users, we, would, we wouldn't be where we are today. And also the, the public sector partners that we work with, uh, the extension to help promote this technology. Uh, again, without the support of the CGIAR and USAID, um, GIZ, uh, the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture and the whole potato team, I really thank you. And uh, to go on, I'd also like to thank the sponsors of the World Potato Congress for, for just um, having the World Potato Congress and for hosting this meeting today. And with that, I am so happy to start taking questions. I see many raised hands and comments coming on the screen. So I will start to, to share with those. Actually, but first I get into those comments, I had two questions uh, come up before the, the seminar, which I will address. Thank you so much uh, for your interest if you had your questions beforehand. Uh, the first question is about, uh, from someone from Kenya. Uh, where can I buy? He was from Miandara, a very uh, important potato producing area. Where can I buy cuttings, certified cuttings? Um, in Kenya, you can buy certified cuttings from Stockman Rosen. They're not far from Naivasha. Uh, transport is very easy to, to where you are located. And, and actually one aspect, I never really addressed in this was the regulatory aspect of the cuttings and uh, as just like uh, as another material in, in seed production these really can be uh, fall into current systems that are established and described as to how to manage them, manage them in a regulatory way uh, in Kenya uh, cuttings are recognized as starter material for certified seed so if you buy them from Stockton Rosen your seed that you produce from that can be certified Another question was about plant variety rights. Uh, again, this question came from Kenya. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, as we work um, in terms of the, the traditional and formal seed system, uh, as cuttings go from uh, through the system, it is at the point of commercial sale of seed that normally royalties are collected. Uh, the cutting is just another form like how many tubers would be, would be managed in this regard. 
Uh, and also when we're working with this technology in terms of uh, validating the smaller, the, the farmer model, uh, which we are looking to validate and, and presenting to see how to formalize this in terms of a re regulatory uh, and plant breeding approach is we work with open access varieties. So we're not working with those that are protected uh, yet. Uh, that could happen in the future, depending on the different private sector partners that, that are engaged. So with that, I'm going to go to the questions and answers. I see, I think I had to escape. Um, so I'm going to first go, I see questions here. And I'm going to start with the first one. And this is, does the apical cutting work with all varieties? Uh, do you face problems? So the apical cuttings right now we use mostly in uh, indig indigenous type. So we have tuberosum indigenous type material. This is, um, we're using a lot of uh, SIP material, which is the open, uh, open access good material. And those are work very well. I am told that the tuberosum, tuberosum, the Northern uh, European type of varieties wouldn't work as well, but we do um, have done cuttings with some of those and they perform uh, equally as well. We haven't done more in depth analysis about that, but uh, right now our indications say no, but we we haven't done a lot of cuttings with the tuberosum type. Uh, then we have how many weeks or months between two seasons. So for the cutting, when you plant it, you plant it directly. So there's no dormancy in terms of accessing that first generation. But after the production of tubers, they're just like a tuber. So you're going to have dormancy in your subsequent seasons. But the first one, as soon as you get that cutting, you plant it. And that also has an advantage in, in, in the system in terms of the total time to get to two certified seed because you really need one season less because the cuttings take less time to produce. Uh, do you make a kind of phytosanitary inspection or certification? Yes, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, we, we have worked with the regulatory body to recognize cuttings and certified seed systems. So uh, uh, nurseries who produce cuttings can, uh, they are, that are certified uh, by the regulatory body, those seed merchants who buy cuttings from them can produce certified seed and that certified seed will be, will be recognized. Uh, uh, and again, th this is, uh, look, we, we work with the different partners to, to uh, integrate cuttings, but again, they would follow the same regulatory process as many tubers, as, as many tubers would. Um, and uh, in terms, someone asked about disease, a cutting should be clean, it's coming from TC, you have good uh, uh, sterile or like really inert planting material, rooting medium, clean water, there's no reason those cuttings should come out essentially disease free, they're in an insect proof uh, house. The biggest disease risk in the cuttings is viruses, you rapidly multiply one plant, I mean many plants from one TC, if you get viruses in there, it's also a very good mechanism to uh, rapidly multiply viruses, so that is what you have to really keep an eye on are your viruses. And uh, is it planning to extend this? Yes, to Cameroon, we have been talking, we have a project there, and we are looking to extend this technology there to, to Cameroon. Um, while I'm here, I really want to give special uh, attention to India. India is a place where I see a lot of potential for cuttings. Uh, they already have a, a very big nursery uh, system. Farmers are used to using nursery seedlings. So there is a place where there's a lot of potential, but also in other countries. We are working in a lot in Uganda, and we are, are looking to extend this technology currently to Cameroon, Nigeria, and also to Ethiopia. And uh, we're also looking, at, and Madagascar, we also work. So it is, it is uh, starting to get out there in a very short period of time. But yes, Cameroon, we are looking to come. Uh, okay, no, we, we haven't done this. Do you see any dormancy differences between daughter tubers produced with mini tubers versus cuttings? Uh, we haven't specifically looked at this, but I'm going to say no. Once you have a tuber, uh, the dormancy would, would, I would imagine, be um, dependent on, on the variety, and, and that's genetics. Uh, and also some of your storage conditions as well can, can affect, uh, have a small effect on your, on your dormancy. Oh, hi, Reddy. Nice to see you. Uh, we have here, is it possible to do tissue culture or plant propagation with effective microbial inoculates? Uh, yes, well, we had started very early on when, when we were looking at fertility at looking at microbial inoculants uh, in the rooting medium uh, for, for the cuttings, uh, not in the tissue culture stage, but at the rooting medium when you take the plants out into this greenhouse. So again, uh, this is another opportunity for knowledge sharing. Um, we haven't done a lot of work in the area of fertility of that rooting media, but uh, we would really appreciate uh, to share more knowledge. And of course, uh, microbial inoculants, if we could, it's all about accelerating that rooting. If we can get rooting down to 14 days from the time that shoot is cut to when it's planted, this would make the system very efficient. Uh, where can I get cuttings in Tanzania? Uh, in Tanzania, they're not doing apical cuttings. Uh, they, you could do uh, uh, stem cuttings, uh, but um, we haven't, we, I'm not aware of any of this being uh, done in Tanzania at the moment. 
Uh, which parameters describe the best rooting performance of a vegetatively propagated plant? So when you're looking at the rooting performance, again, that's a really important part and where we talked about the, um, uh, the, the how, how quick it's going to happen and, and to really accelerate that. So uh, we, it's really a number of days, a uh, number of days to when you have, when you have the, that plant ready to plant out. For, for physiologists, you really want to go more in depth. Of course, you can start looking at root mass and, and comparing at different, at different time lengths. Um, but for us, what we, what we really look at is in a practical way is for when I put that shoot in the plug, when is it ready to go out? And, and what are the temperature, um, temperature, relative humidity and day length effects with temperature really having I think the biggest effect on that. Uh, what is the kind of concentration can be used for rooting hormone? Okay, this is a good question. Rooting hormone or no rooting hormone? Uh, these plants should really not need rooting hormone if you're produ producing in, especially a plug that's a cylinder and you have the, that plug that with the outside mesh, I mean, that's holding the root together, then uh, the, the medium together, then you really don't need rooting hormone. We find sometimes it can be too much and you can have actually too much root growth at the expense of shoot growth. Uh, when we're looking at this conical plug, again, as I talked talked earlier, I think this is where rooting hormone could play a really big role. Um, then from that, I see lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to go to the comments now. And there's 24 comments. Oh, thank you so much for all this interest. It's such a fascinating topic. I love it. Let's go to the top. Um, okay, we had the initial ones when we were getting started. And uh, hello, Bangalore, India. Nice to see you. I see coming there. They could hear me. Oh, Syria. Very nice to see you. I know you're in Turkey, but thank you for joining us today. It's really nice to see people from all over the world. Wow. Uh, question. I don't. Okay. Is it possible to do? Oh, we already talked about that with the microbial inoculants. Hello, Romain from Belgium. Thank you for joining today. Okay, I think we see a lot of the same. Oh, no, here we have a new one. Do you use specific nutrients for multiplication of cuttings? So right now what we are, are using is our, our formula that we use for uh, mini tuber production in this greenhouse, whether we use aeroponics or um, a hydroponic method, we have a, a mix that we make that we, we use that has the macro ingredients, it has microsol with your micro uh, nutrients. Um, and also in, in rural areas where we have some of these small scale nurseries in Uganda and in Kenya, especially in Uganda where there's even more limited options, we start by using a uh, soluble NPK, uh, any kind of soluble fertilizer, uh, something. But of course, again, this is something that we could become more precise uh, and clear on. Uh, but for now, we, we use the mini tuber uh, recipe and it works very well, which can be shared. Um, I might have missed it. Do you foresee a procedure of contamination prevention by cutting equipment? So yes, when, when they're producing the cuttings in the greenhouse, it's a very sterile environment. They uh, use a, a clean uh, implements, which they clean uh, periodically through, through, the, through the production cycle. They maintain good hygiene. Uh, they test their water, uh, their irrigation and the fertigation water. So we, we and they um, have alcohol. Uh, all the greenhouses, small and big, always have alcohol spray for their hands. Um, so we are taking a lot of precautions and they do disinfect their, um, their cutting equipment. Uh, we have why we still need to have aeroponic mini tuber system. Okay, so as I said earlier, uh, aeroponic or hydroponic sand ponics to produce mini tubers uh, is, and then we have the, the cuttings. And uh, cuttings will never replace mini tubers. Mini tubers are, are even though they're, um, they take longer to produce to have at the same time ready, you have to start much earlier with mini tubers. They cost more, uh, but they're much more versatile. I can buy those mini tubers, I can put them on my backpack, I can take a plane to, to Canada, and then I can plant them in two weeks from now, as long as I have all the right phytosanitary certificates. Um, but you can't do that with cuttings. They're, they're much uh, less flexible in, in their use and in, in how to get them from the site of production and into the field. They need to be watered. They're much more delicate. A mini tuber I can plant as long as they're some moisture, the soil and rain, I don't need to worry about watering them. So they're, 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 again, it's looking at the systems and what, what is most beneficial. Some systems, mini tubers are the way. Uh, some other ones, they like cutting. So it's not, um, we can't say one is better than the other. You have to look at where they're, being, where they're operating. Uh, you address the relevance of keeping mother plants young in vegetative phase. Under temp, uh, temp, temperate climate, we should start apical cuttings in winter. 
Uh, so can important the use of artificial long days? Uh, yes, especially if you're in the northern climate and you're having even less than 12 hour days. So here we're on the equator. So we, I would consider our short day as, as a 12 hour day. And uh, we were a little bit concerned that the daylight might have an effect. As you're getting into winter months in the northern or southern hemispheres where you might be having eight and six hour days, you would definitely need artificial lighting and you would have to look at heating. So again, I, I would really look at the cost benefit of, of these supplements in, in that kind of system, um, if it's worthwhile or, or not. Um, but it, it definitely, you would probably have to heat and, and, to, um, and to provide lighting. How... Um, yeah, and uh, again, so and, and going back to that question again, and keeping your mother plants young, I can't emphasize the importance. The most important thing in your production is the maintenance of your mother plants. That's your gold, and uh, and how to keep them young. Again, it's the it's the the heat and and the long days that help to help to keep them in in a juvenile state because it's uh, the short days that, especially with the tuberosum, that would now induce your your tuberization as your day length uh, gets shorter. How to maintain the mother plants shown growing in cocoa peat. Uh, how to maintain your mother plants? It's pretty simple, keep cutting them. Do not let them grow. After you have a couple of nodes, keep cutting. Um, even if you don't have a market for those mother plants and you don't need them for another month, keep cutting them, don't let them grow. That's, that's your source of, 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 your, of your product. And uh, it's all about keep cutting them and keep cutting them, keep cutting them quite low uh, to, to the soil surface, as long as you can see a couple of buds uh, coming out. Um, informative, oh, thank you. Is it possible to get, yes, I, the, this presentation uh, with the audio will be shared. Uh, it will be on the World Potato Congress website and that information will be shared. Uh, hi, Rogers from Ethiopia. Oh, same here. How regularly do you check the mother plants for virus infection? Okay, so uh, a couple things of quality control. So the mother plants, they should be coming from TC plants that are already certified on a regular basis, normally once or twice a year. TC labs submit uh, samples for virus testing. Then when it comes to the mother plants, you should test, uh, at, if you're going to do submothering, you should test maybe uh, at the second uh, cycle of submothering. You would take a few samples because by the time you get those results back, uh, any commercial cuttings that would have been produced from your mother plants, uh, you will know the results before those commercial cuttings are ready to go out. Um, and then at that point, that would be okay. Uh, another uh, very important quality control check is in cuttings, it's really hard to distinguish your variety. It's not like a tuber. Uh, and we've had at the beginning some mix-ups and a lot of understanding that we're, we're learning. Uh, I, like I said, this is a learning process, uh, but also very important at the very beginning is to take a few of your early cuttings or of your submothers and plant them out so that by the time you get uh, distinguished uh, characteristics for your variety, when those cuttings are going out, you, you're able to confirm to confirm their, their identity. So again, you really want to plant some very early production shoots out after they've rooted, let them get their uh, characteristics, maybe flowering, maybe an initial uh, tuber to see some, uh, how the tuber looks to know what, so we don't have these mix-ups. Um, I guess the cost for handling and management of the cuttings are still significant. That's rather good for systems with good labor force, uh, but land scarcity. Is there scope of mechanized planting? Oh, okay, yes. Thank you for bringing this up. Um, yeah, so the cost is, um, uh, actually when it comes to, to the actual product of the cuttings, the cost is less than a mini tuber. And that cost, again, depends on your efficiency of production, how many cuttings you produce from your initial TC plant. Um, but again, the handling is definitely more costly for the user of the cutting uh, compared to, to a mini tuber. Um, when we looked at mechanized planting, yes, of course, we're looking at this. If we want to get larger scale seed producers producing cuttings, maybe on a hectare, you can't really plant that by hand. Um, and so we're looking to see how, how to use existing uh, planters uh, for seedlings for cuttings. And there's also this technology coming out of uh, uh, USA, and I can't remember what university, and I really wish I could, but it's called a pot planter. And uh, so we're also looking at this for, um, a, a, as a way to accelerate uh, transplanting of, of the cuttings, and again, to reduce the cost of transplanting. Uh, what kind of fertilizers apply to the nursery? To apical cuttings in the trays, I already addressed that. It's the uh, aeroponic mixture, the hydroponic fertigation mixture we use for mini tubers. Uh, thank you, Bernard, for France, for your nice compliment. 
which compound, I don't understand that. How does productivity of mother plant to generate cuttings change over time? Good question. Uh, my colleague has done a very nice uh, trial uh, in collaboration with our uh, Stockman Rosen and uh, another private seed producer here in Kenya, where they planted cuttings that came out. At, like I said, once you have that pool of mother plants, they will produce cuttings over a two to three month cycle. Again, all depending on how you manage your mother plants. But we have looked at the cuttings that came out at the beginning and the cuttings that came out like a month later and then two months later. And again, there was no difference in productivity. Um, what I would like to look at is a, a difference in maturity because I'm expecting that the later produced cuttings coming out would mature a bit quicker, but I haven't uh, been able to look into that. Uh, while transporting apical rooted cuttings from one place to other, um, we have experience plants without, oh, the naked root. Yeah, um, yeah, bare root seedlings. We haven't looked at that. We've actually been quite scared. We haven't even tried it. So maybe we could try it on, on, a, on a trial basis and uh, we will definitely try it. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I just, I was a little bit scared of the bare root, but why not try? Uh, it's, even if we lose a box, it's not a big deal to, to see if it works. Oh, Rogers again here from Ethiopia. How does production of cuttings uh, in mini tubers change? between those cut early. I think that's the same. Um, yeah, that's the same one between the cuttings coming out early and later, as I've explained. Um, yes, of course, we can arrange more detailed lecture to Mr. Khalil. Um, thank you for talking to smallholder farmers, horticulture, oh, government of India. Thank you so much for your comments. I have a really warm place for India in my heart after especially the, um, the global potato conclave meeting in January. Very nice meeting. Are conical plugs more economical than pro trays? Yeah, so um, uh, in Kenya, we, we have already uh, access to these commercial plugs with, with a, a mesh around them, and, uh, but that's not available anywhere. So, uh, and we also think that that plug is costing about two cents or 2.5 cents, so it's 20 to 25% of the cost of the cutting. So we also want to see if we can bring that, that down. And uh, so we're looking at these conical plugs, which we expect if we can get a really good uh, methodology to get that root to really form around the plug, or if the bare root plugs can work, then we, we can really bring, make the uh, system even more efficient. Um, we have lightning. Uh, thank you, Ashira from Kenya, a very dear partner of us with National Potato Council. Uh, doing a lot of promotion for us as well here. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Here, how do you manage the difference in age of cuttings? Yeah, so as I said, um, when a cutting is ready, when you take it from that mother plant, two to three weeks, it has to go out. Again, another advantage of mini tubers, you have a much longer marketing window. When that cutting is ready, uh, depending on the size of the plug, the bigger the plug, the longer it can be held in a plug, but you also don't want it to get too long. But you have about a one or two week marketing window to, to, to sell that cutting and to get it planted. Uh, so um, that there uh so let me go back to the question yeah so that uh, that that doesn't have an effect on the age but we we do look at the time of the marketing that you do have a very limited time as composed to a mini tuber uh how long should we maintain the first initial mother plant yeah so the mother plant the first one within the sub mothers we consider those a whole pool if you do do the sub mothering um normally we we see those lasting for about two months <clears throat> or three months but I was very enlightened when I went to the field in December. And uh, again, we, we had cuttings, mother plants that were six months old. And even more incredible <clears throat> is these cuttings were, or these mother plants were maintained during the cold season in Kenya when it can get down to four or five degrees at night. And I was astounded that at these very low temperatures at 12 hour day length, uh, and a lot of cloud, uh, July and August are very cloudy months and very low sunlight uh, in Kenya. And we could still uh, maintain mother plants uh, into from July, August and all the way up into December uh, beyond that cold period. Um, have I noticed homoclonal variation? No, but I would imagine that would be more of a coming from the tissue culture stage rather than from the cutting stage. Because once you get those TC plants into the uh, into the greenhouse, you're only having them for uh, like up to like six months, I guess, depending on on the um, on on your production system. Now let's go back to the comments. Let me go down from one. Okay. We had the rooting hormone here. From one mini tuber, how many mother seedlings can be developed? Now, uh, if you're producing seedlings from shoots on a mini tuber, you're producing stem cuttings. Uh, like I said, in areas where you don't have access to tissue culture plants, 
or where you might have, um, you might only have a hundred mini tubers or a thousand mini tubers, and to really maximize that, you might sprout them out and make cuttings so that for every mini tuber, you might have now 20 stems instead of maybe four or five that you would get from, from that mini tuber. Uh, but um, I, I don't know how many, how many seedlings I can make from, from a mini tuber. But if you're talking a tissue culture plant, again, like as I said, normally when we start the very beginning, we're finding our producers are maybe making 20, 20 to 25 cuttings per initial uh, plant. Uh, but we see uh, a Stockman Rosen, a very professional producer, they don't do the submothering. They just start with their initial tissue culture plant. They have ready access to tissue culture plants, so it works very well for them and their system. And they produce 90 cuttings. Per, per one TC plant without doing any submothering. So again, there's also many variables that contribute to the number of cuttings you'll produce. Again, even just the climate and the temperatures. Uh, oh, Peter, hello. Uh, please explain the importance of genetic background. The, the varieties in Kenya have indigena and other germplasm from the Andes and not pure tuberosa. Okay, so uh, maybe I, I will uh, address this again. There was uh, asking if there was a difference in variety response to, to the production of cuttings. And so a lot right we now, we use a lot of SIP material because it is uh, open access material. And, and so we, we, we have to also work in the regulatory environments and, and respect the, the plant breeder rights. So we, we uh, use our material and SIP material tends to a lot be from uh, Peru, from the Andes, and that's the indigenous type of potato that's grown more on the short day length and adapted for short day length. Then we have the tuberosum type material, which is more of adapted to the long days uh, in, in North America and, and in Europe. And uh, we, we, we also do usually include one or two. There are a few of these open access varieties like Dutch Robin, that is a tuberosum type variety that is um, uh, open, it's older. So we're also using this a little bit in the systems to, to evaluate it. And we're not finding a very big difference in the genetic background, but as I have been advised, um, I'm not a plant physiologist or, or a breeder, uh, I'm a plant pathologist actually by, by my uh, background, um, is that I'm told that the uh, indigenous one responds better to the production of cuttings. And uh, also, I've also heard in aeroponics that indigenous type potato responds better. It has to do, uh, I guess, with, with the phenology and the genetics of the root system and, and how they, and, and, how, and how the response is. Uh, but for tuberosum, again, we don't have a lot of data on, on the, on the, on the performance of tuberosum varieties. We've done it with one. We found it to be quite comparable, not really getting really big numbers, but getting between 10 to 15 tubers, but we're not finding the huge numbers, uh, but still, but we're still within a reasonable range. Uh, how many days we can maintain the mother and submother? Yeah, so as I said, it all depends on your practices, how you keep cu cutting that mother plant. Don't let it grow. Um, we, when we advise, we see at the beginning a lot of these long 20, 30 centimeter mother plants. We wanna keep them small, no more than five, seven, 10, cent seven centimeters. You wanna keep those leaves young and you do that just by keep cutting. We've also seen sometimes when you take that sub mother that it will start to produce compound leaves. If you have compound leaves on your mother, get rid of it. It's not gonna be a good mother plant. Uh, but we have found though, is that if you do see that happening in your mother plants, cut everything right back and then new growth will, will, will be young and, and juvenile again. Uh, what we haven't done is we haven't looked at the production of cuttings or we haven't really systematically looked to see if that has, uh, if you recut and remotherize or rejuvenalize your mother plants, if that has an effect on yield. So that is an interesting question that we would like to, to address. What is it, economics, aeroponic tubers versus apical cutting? So uh, uh, in aeroponics, uh, your tissue culture plant should produce between 20 to 50 mini tubers. Again, that's very variety specific, uh, dependent. Um, uh, aeroponics is a high producer, but it's a very high risk uh, technology. You, if, if you don't have those plants sprayed for two or three hours, you can really set back your yield potential. Um, so we haven't really examined the costing, but we do know based on the sale price, which is another indicator of your costing, that the mini tubers per piece do sell for more. Um, but you could also integrate cuttings in mini tuber production. When you get that initial TC plant, instead of making it be one plant producing mini tubers, you can make some cuttings from it. And now you can have one TC plant, make 10 plants that are producing mini tubers in this greenhouse. So again, another way to, to integrate and adapt this technology.
Um, please, what is the yield of apical cuttings to stem cuttings? So an apical cutting, uh, we have a yield of 10 to 20 uh, tubers per cutting. Uh, that again, we've seen much greater yields, all depending on your management, especially getting that plant well established at the beginning and not giving it any, reducing that potential of the productivity at the beginning of the planting. Uh, but uh, we, we do do our calculations based on 10 to 15. A stem cutting, like, like a stem from a tuber, when we do our basic math, we say one one tuber produces 10 tubers. Uh, each tuber has five uh, stems and each stem produces two tubers when we're doing our very back of the envelope calculation. So we say that a stem cutting, uh, which originated from a more mature mother plant, would produce you between, say, three to five, five tubers if you have good management. Um, do you see differences in physiological status of different timings of, of cutting, storability of tubers? Uh, like I said, um, what we're seeing, and only thing that we've seen an impact on the time, because this is happening over a period of time, is that we've seen this very accelerated maturity. And this, we, if we could understand more and exploit this more, uh, this and, and systematically exploit it, and not just have this be serendipity and luck, this would be um, very, very interesting to know. But right now, in terms of, we're not seeing any difference. The only, and I said, the only other difference in terms of timing is I can start my. Um, my cuttings production much later. I don't need an extra season uh, beforehand before that cutting is ready to plant in the field as you do for, for mini tubers. You really need an eight, and eight, eight to nine month lead for mini tubers to be ready. Whereas for cuttings, um, you can really have like a, a two to three to four month lead to, to before having your, your cuttings ready. Have I considered using SAH for nursery? I don't know what SAH is. Um, time frame TC to fill transplant. Again, that depends if you do your mother plants or you submothering, but normally from the time you take a shoot to rooting and out, it's uh, two to three weeks. Again, always depending on your temperature. Is it possible to get market sized tubers? Yes. Yeah, so, what they do in Vietnam is, uh, and we're looking at this here too, is um, farmers buy the cuttings like, like we are promoting uh, in other countries. And when they plant them on their first harvest, they just sort them the big one for market, small one for seed. And if you have good practices, you know all your tubers are, in terms of uh, phytosanitary status, they're all healthy because uh, you're starting with this extremely elite material. And uh, so, yes, they are producing. We've even seen in other cases, uh, again, that could be variety specific, some varieties more suitable for that directly into market production than others. Um, but we are seeing a significant number of, of market sized potatoes. And like I said, in Vietnam, this is how they do. And they just do this for three or four or five successive seasons until the yield starts going down and then they replenish uh, with new cuttings. Um, have I noticed less bacteria wilt? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, thank you, Peter. This is also, uh, we, we have heard that bacteria uh, bringing cuttings and extremely clean planting material into areas with uh, bacteria wilt that poses a, a really extreme challenge for potato production. It does in many countries in Africa. Um, and uh, we haven't documented it reducing disease, but we are, we can, we, like I said, we have this model in one of the counties in Kenya where it's extremely smallholder land uh, land sizes. We never thought about doing a uh, bulking of seed and not only was it the extreme land size that uh, gave us a negative uh, 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 a negative idea of doing seed bulking there. It was also they have a lot of bacteria wilt in this area. So this would also be a nice uh, opportunity that as because we did find a, 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 an investor to produce cuttings there that if we can to see over time and maybe have a few sample model fields to see if we can really bring a uh, bacteria wilt down. So we do have one uh, uh, model in, in action that we can use as a, as a case study for that. Uh, please, after cutting, do you need the cutting for the next season? No, yeah, so you plant the cutting, you produce tubers, and after that you're following the same uh, traditional model of bulking tubers up to however many seasons you're capable of and when it becomes economic to sell. I guess the cost for handling, hi Thomas, nice to see you, I'm happy you were able to join us today. I guess the cost for handling and management of the cuttings are still significant. That's rather good systems and good labor force. Oh, and uh, endowment, but land scarcity is there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I already sort of answered that. Yes, there is a lot of handling. Um, that's why we, when we looked at getting these cuttings into small, into farmers' hands, how can we bring that scale of nursery down that is suitable for a rural investor to invest in that nursery to have cuttings locally available? And that's what we're currently validating. And uh, our validation is, is very positive. Uh, so once we have this model validated, then we hope to take it, take it further.
Um, have you seen a difference in susceptibility to bacteria? Um, so susceptibility to bacteria wilt? No, we, uh, thank you. We haven't looked specifically at that. If we had a tuber of a, of a variety and a cutting of a variety, if there's going to be more susceptibility to bacteria wilt, we haven't done that. We, um, a lot, uh, um, especially when we're doing for seed production, um, whether it's certified or not, we always test the soil for bacteria wilt just to make sure with this a very elite material that we're, we're not uh, wasting our investment in planting it in infected soil. But we haven't looked at any impact of the actual uh, physical state of a cutting uh, in terms of, of enhanced in, uh, susceptibility to, or to bacteria wilt, no. Uh, but uh, great ideas for topics out there and for sharing knowledge. Uh, what is the composition of the rooting substrate? So right now we're using cocoa peat. It's readily available. Um, it's, it's quite clean. It's a very inert material. We don't expect there to be any phytosanitary uh, risk associated with cocoa peat. Uh, also peat moss. Uh, others might have more availability for peat moss. Again, like cocoa peat, we expect to be very low phytosanitary risk and a very good fertigation uh, uh, regime. Uh, people ask me for the recipe. When do I fertigate when I water? Again, it's so hard. We can't tell you. It's really up to the, to the operator to know their plants when they're looking nice and green and when they're uh, being over fertilized but more often we're not we see them being under fertilized and turning yellow but uh, do, do not despair we've seen uh, under fertilized plants I give them a good a kick of fertilizer and uh, two days later they're, they're nice and vibrant and green again but again any setback will always reduce your yield potential so you really don't want to give setbacks even if you can recuperate you will never recuperate to the same to the same level if you didn't have that setback Oh, Mr. Dr. Murthy from India. Oh, thank you again. I think I've seen that comment in the comments. If I need cuttings and okay, here's a good question. If I need cuttings in October, November, then we have to start cutting preparation in August. Is it possible to maintain low cost, healthy cut cuttings? Our temperatures range to 25 to 35 during August to September. Well, these are almost ideal conditions. Um, uh, in uh, in uh, equatorial Africa, what we find is our, our main growing season is planting in April, and we happen to have the really warm months between January and March. So this works very well that we have the very warm months in, in, the, in the bulking stage of your cuttings, uh, and so that when the rains are coming, you have like very, very good efficient production. Uh, so in your case, um, yes, when you're preparing if you're targeting October, uh, you would start anything from like the second week uh, of September onwards, any shoots you cut, you would root to shoot out. So anything sub up subsequent is your, is your preparatory stage and the warmer it is, the better. Again, you don't want it too warm. If you're getting to 35, you do have to ensure ventilation. Uh, here, we just make sure that we have ceiling vents uh, on either side so that the air movement can move through, the, the warm air that goes up can be taken uh, away from the, the screen house. Uh, we've seen in India, they're doing a great job using a, combining a charcoal cooling technology with the screen house and outtake fans where one wall has the, the, um, the, the water cooler floating down the wall. And then on the other side of the screen house, you have the outtake fan. So it's drawing that evaporated moisture across the cuttings and cooling them, uh, which is a brilliant system. That was a quite a large scale uh, screenhouse and I'd really like to see how we can adapt that to a smaller scale screenhouse. Uh, we're looking when we talk small scale we're talking about maybe two to five meters by ten meter screenhouse whereas that other one was quite large we're probably talking about a, a half acre uh, a size of screenhouse. Yes, and India, cocoa peat, again, you have so much cocoa peat, you have the growing media. As I said, India, I see, uh, in many places, I see a lot of potential, but in India, really for it to accelerate, to take off without a lot of promotion and awareness creation needed, because already there's so much mindset in the systems in place to integrate this technology in, into Indian systems. Um, Mr. Shahid Ali, thank you. Why IRC have much more potential in producing more mini tubers than the stem cutting? So um, again, like in the in the apical cutting, it's produced from a tissue culture plant, and that tissue culture plant is as juvenile a physiological state in the potato plant you can get. That's younger than your sprout. Your sprout is already physiologically old compared to a tissue culture plant. And what is indicative or the, the sign of the juvenile or the very young state is the simple state of the leaves. If you look at a tissue culture plant, those leaves are so simple, there is no near, nowhere near compounding of the leaves. And then when you take that mother plant out, you really keep those leaves simple. And that is how you know you're in a very juvenile state. As soon as you get the compounding, that is now the development into the maturity. And uh, apical cuttings in potato, like any cutting that you make, it's always about keeping your mother plant young. 
right? We always know that if the mother plant, especially if it's in any kind of reproductive phase, is no longer a mother plant for any kind of cutting, which applies to potato. And the younger, the more productive you're going to be. And from the stem cutting, it's coming from a sprout. It comes from a stem. This is mature. They're all compound leaves. So again, it's going to root very well. It's going to be stronger. The stem and the collar will be stronger. You'll have a better establishment, uh, but you won't have the same productivity. Um, and I want to say as establishment, now we are seeing Farmers having these cuttings and they're having 95, 99, 100 percent establishment. We're getting a lot of feedback. Before it was 80, 70. That was at the beginning, but now we're seeing establishment quite a few cases between 95 to, to 100 percent. Which compound is used to develop the cuttings? Oh, I think we had already what fertilizers applies in the nursery. We have. Uh, do someone make seedlings in Europe? Uh, I'm not aware of this uh, in, in Europe. Again, uh, as the other question with the winter preceding, if you're planting in April, May, uh, if you're going to be producing cuttings February, March, it's going to be quite cold. So you really have to look at the cost benefit of the um, of heating and, and lighting your, your, your greenhouse uh, and the value of the material. Um, and uh, there has been, again, I want to bring up the risk of viruses. Uh, I have a very good colleague who, who warned me about this. I had tried it, I think, in Prince Edward Island, and, and viruses were quite uh, a bigger risk because you have the green young material exposed uh, for a longer period of time, but not if you're having six weeks of maturity, but if you're having three month, you are re or three month maturity to you have your seed before dehoming, um, you're having young material exposed for a longer period of time, which might be more susceptible to, to, vir uh, to um, aphid transmitted viruses or vector transmitted viruses. Uh, but we are looking at, uh, at the virus risk and we are putting that together to see, see what, what the risk in viruses are. But we don't have that very well documented yet. Can we get step by step protocol for Malawi? Yes, Philistus, we will look to see how to bring this technology to Malawi. We are working with uh, our SIP office there. Uh, can potato aeroponic technology prove beneficial for high? Yes, so aeroponic technology is another technology. It's, it's very, very productive, but again, there's a, it's a lot more resources and management. So we always have to look at the trade-offs and the balance between what you put into the system and what you get out of the system. And especially for beginners, we really don't uh, encourage uh, or uh, uh, aerop uh, aeroponic technology, but again, it also depends on the profile of the producer. So there's many different aspects to consider, again, in, in which kind of technology we'll use if you are to venture into seed. And as I and also show there's so many different seed models out there that uh, it really depends on, 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 the, on the profile of the producer. Okay, good question. Thank you for that. Uh, when I'm mentioning yields of 10 to 15 tubers of what size? Sorry, let me just take a sip of water. So here, when I'm talking these 10 to 15 tubers, I'm talking tubers that are 20 millimeters and greater. And this is the assumptions that we have behind. Um, that if your tuber is 20 millimeters or greater, the next season you're going to plant it in the field like a normal seed tuber at your traditional uh, uh, 75 uh, centimeter space between your ridges or your rows and your 30 centimeters or 25 centimeters between plants in a row. So whether that tuber is 20 millimeters or 50 millimeters, you're really not going to change your spacing. You might just change your intra row spacing a little bit down to 25 centimeters, but you're still going to use about the same area of land. And, uh, but you, and I mean, you're still going to plant it directly in the field. If it's a, a, like a mini tuber, because like I said, um, at 10 to 15 tubers, those are greater than 20 millimeters, but we also produce maybe five to 10 mini tubers in addition to those 10 to 15. And those are the ones that uh, are, that we don't plant directly to the next, I mean, out to the field, they would undergo another nursery stage. So those tubers would come out a generation later, a season later than the ones that you, that were bigger from the first uh, harvest from the cuttings. And why do we look at, at, again, I alluded to this, why are we more concerned about number than of weight and size is again, if I have 46,000 tubers and if they're 30 millimeters or if they're 50 millimeters, I'm still going to plant a hectare the next season and I'm still going to assume a one to 10 multiplication ratio. I know a bigger tuber might give me slightly more uh, eyes, more stems, more tubers, but when we're doing our projections, we don't, we don't really distinguish between that. And so, and again, and that's why we look at tuber number, whether those tubers, again, are big or small, you're still going to plant the same area. And I'm expecting about the approximate same yield. Uh, do you have specific POP pack package of practice for mini tuber? 
I don't understand what POP is, but yeah, we do have very good guides. Uh, I can direct you to Market a Bit the SIP uh, website, and uh, there we, we do have one of our, our most uh, frequented uh, uh, public uh, materials we have on the website actually is the production of mini tubers. So there is a guide there on, on, on really the detailed instructions and protocols. Oh, hi, Raish from Pakistan. Wow, this is just so special to have really a global, a global presence here today. What is the impact of this technique on quality of tuber? Okay, so now uh, the cutting is elite material like a mini tuber. If we, if we can get these into, uh, into the, so that the first uh, tuber produced is gonna be equal quality as that of a mini tuber. It's all gonna depend on your good, good, good agricultural practices, having planting in clean soil, uh, keeping the diseases away. So once it's exposed to the soil and to the external environment, the risk is the same for a mini tuber and a cutting. Again, some of those detailed risks like the bacteria wilt, there could be maybe more risk for a cutting and the same like the viruses. But in general, we look at degeneration and the risk of that as, as uh, a quite, um, uh, in general, we look at that as quite equal uh, in, the, in the quality of the tuber. And again, it's all dependent on, on the management and also your site, uh, making sure to be at high elevation and in sites where you don't have so much uh, risk from, from vector, from vector uh, vi vi uh, virus, vi or oh, whatever, viruses caused by vectors uh, or spread by vectors. If the cutting will have a compound leaf, is it possible to use further? So uh, in the production of a mother, no. Once your mother plants start producing compound leaves, especially if they're old, because you are forcing that plant to stay quite young for a long time, and sometimes it just wants to, to grow really quickly, uh, you, I would say no. But if, if you have your mothers at an early stage, especially sometimes we find when we take the shoot and we want to make another mother with that, it starts to produce compound leaves right away. At that point, we cut it back, and we find that what comes from that is very juvenile leaves. Uh, what we do need to do more systematically is to really ensure that the cuttings planted in the field behave the same uh, and have the same productivity as a cutting that came from a mother plant that we never had to re, uh, rejuvenalize it, the, the plant. Um, and on the cutting, so when it comes to the commercial cutting that you're going to sell, uh, we do really as an optimum, as I showed earlier, uh, let me see if I can... No, I can't. Um, as, a, as a cutting to, uh, for, um, to sell optimally, we'd like that cutting to have uh, simple leaves I showed earlier in the presentation. Uh, but also if that commercial cutting starts to develop compound leaves, um, I wouldn't worry too much because you get it planted in the field and it's gonna do the same thing anyway. So whether it starts to do that in the greenhouse or in the field, I'm gonna estimate no, there should not be a huge impact on that. But again, I do not have a systematic answer to respond to that. Again, another option for uh, knowledge sharing. We talked about the hormone already. Does the generation only start once you have the first tuber? Okay, so when we talk about uh, generations, uh, many different countries and their seed systems have many different ways of classifying it. How we like to, when we're talking in a general way and, and not following a regulatory uh, system, we like to look at the cutting uh, and we just look at field generations. How many field generations? So when you plant that cutting and you get that first harvest, that's your first field generation. And then you have your subsequent second, third uh, generation. And so um, when we're not in, a, in an audience where we have a systematic way of describing generations, because I said there are different ways of doing that, this is how we like to talk is the number of field generations, because that really is a, a sort of an indicator of your exposure and your risk of degeneration and loss of seed quality. Oh, okay, SAH, semi-autotrophic hydroponics. This is quite fancy words for me. I have to go back to that question. Sorry, my mouse is acting. So do we, since you responded to that question, um, let me go back down here. Um, Benjamin, if you could just re-put your question about the semi-autotrophic hydroponics so I can answer, I just can't find it. Easily, well, easily when I'm scrolling back up. Um, okay, so a nice Virga from Ethiopia. Have you done a study on frequency of watering after transplant to the field and other cares? So no, we haven't looked at that. Again, we can't tell you water once a day or twice a day. It depends. Uh, if it's warm and sunny, we say water in the morning and water late in the afternoon. If you have rain, you don't have to water. Uh, again, we, we can't provide a systematic uh, recipe for watering. It all depends on the ambient conditions, cloudy, sunny, rainy, humid, dry. Uh, so there's many different factors, but we just say to make sure that, you know, as, as people who plant these know may have had uh, experience in other kinds of seedlings. So we also uh, expect that knowledge to be transferred to, to the cuttings.
Uh, but we also do a lot of training as well. Okay, I didn't talk about that, but especially when it comes to farmer use, there's a huge training program behind that. Uh, very nice that we work with the private producer. We also work with the public extension to really bring the, the farmers on board uh, and, and, uh, and train them. And these are also farmers who know how to grow potato, who've been trained in other interventions on potato. So we're not training them how to grow a good potato. They've already been trained in that, but we're just now bringing them another kind of potato to grow to apply that knowledge to. And then to to give them the specifics about the technology. Yes, is there any uh, work of, of this initiated in India? Yes, there is. So please reach out to SIP and, and, and to the, oh, the, the national program, sorry, I can't remember off the top of my mind what the name of it is, but very, very, uh, very integrated and very interested in, and they're already producing these cuttings, um, the national program there that's uh, for potato and, uh, and, and with SIP working with other partners. Early tuberate, uh, here we go. Hi, Ian. Early tuberization and cuttings and earlier home destruction might aid in virus control. Yes. So we're looking that because we don't want big tubers, especially if you're not going into where. Uh, once we have an egg size or 20 millimeter tuber, we can be home. Um, so again, even if you're not getting that uh, rapid maturity, maybe you could be home at 70 or 80 days. Uh, if we can really exploit and systematically exploit that early maturity, then uh, we can really look at reducing and having a 40 day tuber. And again, and that would significantly reduce your virus risk, whether you have soft material or not, just because of the reduced exposure time. Uh, how critical is field soil type for successful cuttings in the field? Again, you would want something that's conducive for potato, something where you're going to have your root system growing down, you're going to have your tubers growing down. We, we recommend on planting th that the bed is maybe five centimeters high, so above your soil line, with my bottom hand here being the soil line, and really digging down about 20 centimeters, uh, 30 centimeters, uh, and then with a slight hilling. Uh, what we also want to look at is to, to really maximize and, uh, and balance hilling uh, so that we don't we, we want to see that if we can really do more work at transplanting and have a more deeper uh, below the soil profile worked and ready for the roots to penetrate and for the tubers to grow and develop that you might not have to heal so much um, uh, during uh, you know for it during it because you still traditionally would heal but we want to see how we can reduce that to reduce the labor load later uh, what does the size of the seed in the first multiplication matter? So I guess after we produce that first tubers, uh, we were asked earlier, uh, the, the 20, like what size, uh, when we say 10 to 15 is the 20 millimeter. Um, again, a bit bigger, uh, we, 20 millimeter is kind of our cutoff when we're looking at our data. We work, and uh, again, we're, we're very pleased that all of the data we have generated has been like from actual users. It hasn't been on a research station. Again, not to undermine the value of that, but really we went right to the field and, and all of the data is from our farmers and from our seed producers. So we, we look at 20 millimeters as the cutoff, but again, I don't think that's the average size. The average size is going to be bigger than that. We are getting, I'm going to say, more in the 30 to 45 millimeter range. And again, we would expect with bigger size, more eyes, more uh, more stems, more bigger production. Uh, uh, but, but we haven't uh, systematically looked at that. But um, we, we always assume a 1 to 10 because whether you have some that are 20 millimeters, some that are 40, some that are 50, in the end, the average is going to, is going to be, is going, everything will average out. Uh, is there any effect on the shape of tubers produced from ARC? No, we haven't seen that. That um, is basically, fall, uh, the shape follows the genetics, uh, if it's an oblong tuber or a round tuber, we're not seeing that as being affected, uh, whether it's coming from a cutting or from a mini tuber. Uh, guidelines for production of mini tubers. Yes, they are on the SIP website. Uh, there was a, a guide um, done quite a while ago. It needs to be severely updated. We've done a lot of learning since then, but there is a preliminary guide there, which, which does give a, a good basics, but there's a lot of these tricks of the trade uh, from the lessons learned that have not been integrated into that guide yet, and that will be there. There's also a presentation that I have uh, for a technical presentation, and I can also see about how we, we can make that more widely available as well and communicate that. May I get a copy of the audio? Yes, this pre uh, presentation will be, uh, is being recorded. What is the spacing uh, rope for cuttings in the field? So what we uh, find uh, after many different trials is that we, uh, uh, optimal spacing to balance number and size is to have two row beds, uh, 30 by 30 centimeters between the rows, having at least 30 centimeters to the edge. Uh, one of the big observations we had from Uganda uh, with seed producers producing uh, tubers is that they weren't making from the, the, the two rows to the edge of the bed that wasn't wide enough. And you're having 
a, a significant number of stolons that were growing out. So there you've lost your tuber. So we really um, want to make sure that you have a uh, the, between the edge of the bed to, to those rows uh, enough, it's wide enough so that you really keep all of that stole on development within the uh, undercover. And again, this is also dependent on variety with some varieties producing longer stolons than others. So in this case, I guess uh, in any seed production, short, shorter stolons would mean a little bit less hilling requirement. Uh, hi, Elizabeth from uh, Agriculture and Agriculture Food Kenya. I just wanna make some mention of some of the, the partners that we have with us today. Uh, what is the success rate of apical cuttings in the field? Um, yeah, so we have at the beginning, we, we uh, let me see, how can I, uh, first of all, to, to uh, describe success rate. Uh, when we're looking at success rate, we, we distinguish between a seed producer who is a little bit more uh, enabled to, to produce cuttings or to, to manage a cutting compared to a smallholder farmer who might have a little bit less access to resources to manage that cutting. Uh, but when we look at performance, we look at survival. Uh, at the beginning, we had survival rates of you know, 70, 80 percent, most most were following in that. But as as we get this technology out and with more training and and with more more use, that we're really seeing survival going up, up quite significantly, up into 90, 95, and a lot of cases of near 100 percent survival. So that's one thing we look. But really, it's then against the number of tubers. And uh, like I described earlier, uh, we really measure the performance in terms of number. Uh, we do record weights because we do want to have an interest in the size distribution, um, and we do uh, classify you know within the greater than 20 millimeters but it's really about about the numbers then we have I think that was let me get here oh thank you everybody you have really nice comments I, I, I hope I get to also keep all of these and I, I will look at them uh, again let me see I have this is where I left off um, okay I think this one is here Yes, yeah, so another message from, from Roman here from uh, the president of the WPC and he's looking forward to seeing everybody in, uh, in Dublin. So we hope everybody stays safe and, uh, and looking forward to have it, having uh, uh, to, to, get to, re, to reconnect uh, in Dublin. Uh, we have here from Dr. Shriva, oh, uh, Srivastava, I hope I pronounced that a little bit nicely. How many cuttings from one plant would be optimum? to maintain plant potentiality of growth. So when we're looking from the tissue culture plant, again, we're, uh, we aim uh, for about 50 to 200 cuttings per TC plant. Uh, again, that's all gonna be depending on the different conditions, uh, what, what your productivity is going to be. Uh, again, when we start, we're seeing 15 or 20, but again, that's at the beginning. There's a lot of learning processes, especially for the more smaller scale producers who don't have a background in, in uh, nursery management and in vegetative propagation. Uh, we've worked with other nurseries who pick it up a bit quicker, but they also um, are already have, are quite knowledgeable in vegetative propagation. And again, 80% of the theory and, and the practices that you would apply in, in any kind of uh, cuttings, um, nursery management, it, it applies to potato. Do you think it could be an excellent technology for development of women entrepreneurship? In whole process, how much can be woman participation in terms of percentage? So when we look at the nursery production, uh, actually ladies with the smaller nimble fingers, it's a bit easier for them because those, those stems, we're, we're talking stems, when you cut them, uh, when, when you get them ready for rooting, these are like two or three centimeters long and, uh, and a little bit more nimble fingers. And, and we know in tissue culture as well that uh, women are a little bit more nimble in terms of managing and handling the plant. And uh, that's just because of the physical nature of, of how we are. Um, but also, I think in terms of the management, uh, I see both great uh, women and men uh, managing and troubleshooting in their nurseries. But again, this is an opportunity for women. But we also never want to undermine um, that, that there's also, we have to ensure that we have the right profile. Uh, whether you're a man or a woman in terms of producing the cuttings, you, you have to, you, you know, you have to live up to certain criteria to, to, to really be an effective producer of, of cuttings and maintaining that quality control. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean a high education, but it does mean a, a certain
certain level of, of knowledge and, and, and competency. And so, of course, when, when women um, are able and, and have those competencies, we really do uh, encourage them as, as we encourage women in, in all of our activities and, and men, and we really like to see equal representation among the two of them. But yes, this can be applied to women in terms of the production. And we really like to see, uh, because this is acting higher up in the value chain and in the delivery uh, model, is we really do like to see women uh, engage it in all levels at the like the high high resource high competency stages of, of production of early generation seed and then even as we move down the system and into farmers using them uh, again nursery management this is really tends to be a, a lot of a woman's job especially on, on these on these farms the nursery and so we really see working with women and and how to do the nursery production but then and then how but then again you have the more social aspects after that in terms of managing the production and again that's what requires a multidisciplinary team in terms of really scaling this technology out and into the, especially when we're look, talking about the smallholder farmers because that's where really the you know 95 percent of the users would be in there um, in terms of the seed coming from cuttings or producing or cuttings themselves and really to have a multidisciplinary team to to ensure that an equitable access and use uh, of this technology and dissemination of this technology through the system is there any effect of physiological age of apical rooted plants? Yeah, so as I said earlier, um, when we looked at these plants and we saw these tubers at six weeks, this, uh, because those cuttings that produce those plants, they were the last cuttings coming out of the production cycle in the nursery. And then we had those egg sized tubers at six weeks. Uh, so I think there's a physiological response. Those plants were, were forced to stay juvenile for so long that when they finally were planted out and given the freedom to, to grow, they, they really accelerated in their development. Um, I'm not a physiologist, but I think that's where I would begin to start to investigate, to understand the physiological reason behind it. And again, if we can have more understanding how we can exploit that in a systematic way, I think that would really, again, lend another positive to, to this technology. <coughs> yes, and we have, oh, sorry, excuse me. We have, Kumar here from India, who is, they're doing this in Assam, they're doing it in Bangalore, they're really taking it on in India, and I really see a lot of success uh, coming out of India, in addition to where we are working currently. Um, we have here, <clears throat> one of my colleagues from Nairobi. Uh, hi, Ellie. How can the quality of cuttings be assured under smallholder conditions? So when we're looking at smallholder conditions, we're looking at a system of them buying cuttings and saving them on farm. And this is uh, a similar kind of thing like positive selection. Many of you might have be familiar with this kind of technology. And it's all about in, empowering the farmer and how to manage their quality assurance and to produce their own seed. So again, we, and, and like in potato, it's good crop rotation. Uh, it's about good management, especially when it comes to a small nursery, it's easier to be more intense if you have a three by five meter nursery to really ensure good quality uh, and, and, you know, and good practices in there. So um, as, and so when we're doing this and looking at for the farmers, we, it, it has to come with the training and it has to come with, with you know, uh, like, like we would have done in the positive selection. And also really importantly, when, when we look at the, fall, the smallholder system, it's about saving seed for their own use. They are not commercial seed producers. So that seed, and we make it very clear when we're doing this promotion, uh, that that seed is for their own use on their own farm. Uh, thank you again. So many nice compliments, Cassia here. And we have, oh, I, get, I asked her that question about the guides. I think we're getting to the end. And, oh, thank you, Robert, for your nice compliment. And here we have Paul, again, another a colleague from our Nairobi office. So regular harvest of cuttings keeps mother plants younger. Exactly. It's all about keeping those plants cutting. And if they're, sometimes I see pictures, we have lots of WhatsApp groups that we share and so that we can provide feedback, uh, um, even without these restrictions and movements, because we have producers in many different rural and, uh, and places that we can't visit all the time. So we do provide them technical backstopping through these WhatsApp groups. And uh, it's all about keeping those cuttings young and keep cutting them. And even if you don't, we see them sometimes they're overgrown. And even if you don't want to plant them and make cuttings because you don't have a market or maybe you don't have your rooting media ready, but it's better to cut and dump and maintain that mother plant. That is really important in keeping the juvenile stage. Um, let's see here. I think we're getting to the end. 
Dear Monica, do you foresee packing of cuttings to sell in supermarkets? You know that it's, um, why not? <laughs> if you can sell, I see them selling seedlings of basil and other things in supermarkets for even general households like us, gardeners. And um, again, with, with a nice guide and a little pamphlet on how to use it, that could be another uh, marketing option to try and to see if there's use uh, and for these gardeners to plant them and just to produce their own potato for their own home use. Uh, because this would be targeting again a different market segment where we wouldn't be looking at so much the, the commercial use of that cutting, but that cutting like as a use as a home gardening, um, a home, another a home gardening seedling. So again, that's another option for these cuttings, which I never even thought of. Uh, great. Thank you, uh, Simon, from our partner at Stockman Rosen. Oh, Nicholas, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and there we go. I think we are at the end of our uh, questions and yes a very nice last comment and i would like to read it out uh, from from india from my colleague reddy there and thank you he likes nice to see that there's many people are interested in these apricot rooted cut, cut cuttings and now this family is growing and we really are uh we are really uh in have a big network as i mentioned all those countries earlier and, and our partners and all of these networks and so we're, we're really pleased to see that this technology has accelerated so rapidly um almost sometimes i, I feel like it's going too quickly and, and it's and we're hearing feedback from the field and sometimes we're correcting things because there was again a little bit of a misunderstanding and certain different technical details which we see can have a really big impact and uh, but we're really pleased and to see the interest and the demand from the private sector and and from the public institutions who provide that really important the services and the enabling environment and and again the general stakeholders that we work with the partners uh, that enable the scaling of this technology and so with that i think there's no more questions and again i thank everybody with the overwhelming response uh, this is just this wonderful and uh, please uh, we will keep in contact through the World Potato Congress. We have our different SIP offices which we can connect through and I think with that I will close today's seminar. I wish everybody a really safe evening uh, again in this time that we're all at home and I hope everybody is doing okay. And, oh before I close I see a raised hand and I'm trying to access these raised hands. How do I do that? Question and answer, 59. Um, let's see, what is the right method? Yes, oh, okay, so I'm just gonna ask this because this is important, sorry. I keep getting questions and, and if people wanna still and stick around and listen, I have already said an initial uh, heartfelt goodbye and, and wishing everybody a nice evening, afternoon, morning, where in the world you are. And uh, for those who still wanna stick around, I will still answer some, some questions because again, I, I, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> um, so we had another question here. What is the right method to sow cuttings in the field, either a flatbed or raised bed? Yeah, so what I had just mentioned, uh, and we do have a pamphlet on our, our website about just specifically about planting cuttings, not about the care later, but just to, to get them planted. And we do say a bed of about five centimeters, not too high, uh, to, and to, to work the soil under the ground. Uh, maybe 20 to 30 centimeters. And then when, uh, when it comes to hilling, you might hill that another maybe 10 or 15 centimeters, but we're looking to see how to, how to maybe get a better uh, a condition at transplanting to reduce the labor later on. Uh, but we're not looking at a ridge as you would plant a potato tuber. No, we don't want that ridge to be that high uh, because that root development, it'd be, we've even seen in our, in our profile, I've had a profile I'm gonna say of about 40 centimeters and when we cut into that profile at the last 10 centimeters uh 15 we saw nothing and so that was really really telling in terms of how deep we go and so we really don't want to start with the higher bed we'd rather start deeper at the beginning and not have such a high bed to ridge but again that's not uh uh uh, let's see, like a specific guideline, um, but that's what we recommend. But we, we do not recommend, and what we see a lot of is when uh, farmers or, or users get these cuttings and they're planting four or five row beds, that you'll, you'll just never get big numbers. You will never surpass 10 tubers uh, a plant if you're really planting in a dense condition. Uh, these tubers, the, the, the vegetative growth can get quite uh, vigorous. Uh, we've seen them really, really vigorous, thigh high. So you're really about one cutting is producing the same kind of uh, foliage as a uh, tuber. 
So you're getting a lot of foliage. But in other instances, we've seen that the, uh, the plant, it gets maybe 45 centimeters high and it really does not look stunning in the field. It doesn't look like it could be mature, but mature and when you harvest a plant, you're not really seeing a yield, uh, a yield penalty underground. So uh, even if you do not get that vigorous growth, you can still expect to see a lot of tubers. Um, oh, hello from Tawa from Cameroon. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, another private sector partner who's looking to invest in cuttings in, in Cameroon. And yes, we are uh, looking to organize trainings. There is a request for trainings. We do normally do our trainings with our private sector partners. So we, you get to see the production in a large scale greenhouse. And depending on the program, we um, also organize to go visit a small scale greenhouse. So you can really see how the system is working at, at different business models. Models. Um, but yeah, that's normally our model for training. And, and then and that's also then a service that our private sector partners provide is a, a training service. And so again, how many cuttings can you get from a TC plant? I've already said that we expect between 50 to 200 when you're really getting at a, at a commercial state. Um, let's see, here we have a question. After planting ARC plants four centimeters in deep, how many times of earthing up should be done to get the highest number of tubers? Um, so again, we are looking at about hilling up for another after you plant four centimeters deep. And when you plant the cutting, so if I have, uh, let me see. Oh, I'm going to try to escape since we are now doing extra questions. And I think I had to stop share then. I don't want to share the presentation. No, that's not going to work. Um, let me see, just one moment. I escape and then I'll share my screen again. Well, I hope I didn't lose something. Okay, now let me go back and share my screen. Okay, so if someone can send me a quick message that they're seeing my screen as I change the slides, that would be nice. Um, I really hope, so when, let me see, someone has commented here. Um, yes, okay, good, thank you, Nora. Now, as I go to this slide here, you see you have the collar line of the cutting uh, right there. So normally when we would transplant it, we would also transplant, try to transplant another node so that you really get the uh, greater formation of roots underground. And so when you do that, because you already have the beginning of your roots higher up, we don't think that you have to heal uh, as much as you would heal a normal tuber. Uh, and um, so we, we look to heal at about 15, 10 to 15 centimeters on top of when you plant on that five centimeter raised bed. And let me see here. Yeah, from Tawa. This is amazing technology. Yes, and for Rwanda. Great. So I think that is the end of the questions and the comments and the feedback. So for those who stuck around for the last part, again, I really thank you. This has been, wow, to be a, a, a being presented and, and being watched across the world. This is really an honor for, for SIP and for the Petito program and, and really to give this technology some more of the recognition that we see is, is very valid. It's um, re really taking off again when we have the right environment and the right resources and the right partners, the public and the private we really see how this technology can take off. So with that, again, I, I thank you everybody for joining from all the countries. Let me see my list again. I, I have it here. And so that was from Kenya and Peru. Uh, for my colleagues in Madagascar, again, I have a special mention. Madagascar, they have faced so many challenges and, and they're really trying and, and to, to use these cuttings technologies and we're really trying to support them there. Uh, to Uganda, again, where we're doing great work. <clears throat> 
in India, where I see a lot of potential, Ethiopia, Malawi, you have USA, uh, Canada, Nigeria, Cameroon. We're also working in Georgia and Rwanda and our colleagues everywhere. We really thank you for your participation today and your amazing feedback and all of your questions. It really shows that this is a really fascinating story and a really fascinating technology. So I think with that, I will wish everybody a really good morning, afternoon, evening. Stay safe. I hope you all stay healthy and, uh, and soon we'll be able to travel and, and to really be with, uh, with one another in person. I know with the World Potato Congress and the uh, different potato associations, the European Potato Association, the American Potato Association, it's just a really a great bunch of, of colleagues and, and people and that work together. And it's just such a nice environment to be in. And I'm really happy to be a part of this world. So with that, I wish everybody good night. I wish I could see everybody. Um, so I, I hope I, I'm having smiles in the background and uh, we will hopefully be keeping in touch. And again, this presentation is recorded and we will see with World Potato Congress and with SIP, um, if we are having an overwhelming response, how do you uh, coordinate uh, a really good response to, to address all of, the, all of your queries and, and to share that knowledge? Because I think I've put out a couple of hints of where we really could use some knowledge sharing. So with that, I thank you and I have a very good evening, morning, afternoon. Oh, let me see.